Our epistle reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, uh, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like man, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love, now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence." for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we today finish our sermon series on 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's been long period of time. Uh, it's a long epistle, and we were able to cover a lot of topics. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So, it's the last chapter of this epistle, and you know, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that this division into chapters was not how Paul was writing his epistle. We introduce chapters and verses much, much later in the Middle Ages so that we can easily quote the scriptures. But for the Apostle Paul, it was one long letter. Uh, and in that letter, he is addressing this small church in Corinth, this relatively small and young church in Corinth, which is in Greece, which is located in Greece. Paul himself, he is in Ephesus, uh, which is on the other side of the screen. So it says Ephesus, uh, and the last S is missing. So he's in Ephesus at the moment. And you can see that he can easily probably cross the sea. But uh, when he talks about his future plans to visit Corinth again, he's talking about visiting Macedonia, which is uh, north of Corinth. So it's like Upper Peninsula and Jenison, right? Or Grand Rapids. So he's going to Macedonia. He's using this land route. And he will be visiting on his uh, way to Corinth. This is his plan 
churches uh, in uh, Philippi, in Thessalonica, you can see at the top of this screen, it says Thessalonica, uh, and Paul writes his epistles to Thessalonians, you probably uh, remember those epistles, and then he uh, visits other churches on his way to Corinth. So this is his plan. So this ch small church in Corinth has a number of problems. And uh, uh, basically, the latter consists of two parts. Uh, the first part is problems reported by the house of Chloe. And Chloe is a Christian in Corinth. And uh, uh, now people who belong to this house, they uh, reported to the apostle Paul some problems. And the problems were factions and divisions in the church. And the Apostle Paul is talking about those divisions. And he says, well, you are not supposed to be divided. Jesus died for you. I mean, how relevant it is to us. How easily Christians can be divided today. How easily we people can be divided today. And Paul says, no, this is not what the church is about. So we have one Lord who died for all of us. We should be united. So factions in the church, so it's chapter one to four, and then sexual immorality, all kind of sexual uh, sins. And we know that today, especially within the last 70 years, people are using sex and sexuality and all kind of sins related to sex and sexuality as a banner, as a flag, right? And they just want to let everybody know about their sexual immorality. Now it's super relevant to us today because back then people practiced sexual immorality like they do today. So, and Paul talks about sexual immorality in chapter 5 and then in chapter 6. Also in chapter 6, Paul talks about lawsuits among brethren. And this is what happens today as well. Uh, especially we are living in a culture that so easily uh, tries to sue one another, right? Oh, I will sue you. I will sue you. This is uh, like, you know, becomes an, a sport. Uh, so who can sue whom? And Paul says, well, this is not what you're supposed to do within the church, right? So what are you doing? Why are you suing one another? So this is just crazy. Stop it. Then moral defilements in general. So that's a problem we face today in our days as well. So chapter 1 to 6, these are problems reported by the house of Chloe. So now starting with chapter 7 and to chapter 15, we can see that Paul is addressing problems mentioned in the letter from Corinth. Uh, he received a letter, probably from the family of Stephanas, whom he mentions both in chapter 1. He says, I baptize only his family. And also in chapter 16, which we just read, when he says, well, Stephanas visited me in Ephesus. He, he now is responding to questions they have. And every time he responds to a new question, he says, concerning marriage, chapter 7, concerning idols, next chapter, chapter 8, right? Concerning spiritual gifts, concerning the resurrection of the dead, concerning the collection uh, for the saints. So he's responding to one specific question the church has. And that church had a lot of questions. So about marriage and celibacy, what is, you know, the relationship between husband and wife uh, in a Christian home, what it means to be divorced, what it means to be a widow and be a Christian. So, and then he talks about eating meat sacrificed to idols, a big problem back then. Women, the role of women in the church, right? So then uh, the Lord's Supper, how we treat one another in the church. And then spiritual gifts, like the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, is responding to those questions. Then the resurrection of the dead, this is the big one. So Jesus rose from the dead. Now, we will be raised from the dead as well. So uh, basically, chapter 15 is one of the few uh, detailed descriptions of the resurrection of the dead we have in in, in, in the Bible, in the New Testament. So we're so thankful that this uh, epistle uh, is included in the New Testament and survived. Then the final chapter, 
the Lord's people, collections for the same, concluding remarks, instructions, and benedictions. And we have arrived with you, uh, we, we are now in chapter 16, the final chapter. So, uh, now, as we read it, I don't want you to think about this, oh, this happened long time ago. I want to see you how the Holy Spirit is teaching his church. Because uh, Jesus rose from the dead 20 years ago. Now we have this new church in Corinth. And the Holy Spirit is working within this church and building this church. And how the Holy Spirit is teaching and rebuking and encouraging through the Apostle Paul this little church. Now concerning the collection for the saints. As I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And the Apostle Paul is talking about collections for uh, the church in Judea, uh, in, in Jerusalem. Now, what happened in Jerusalem? So once they started preaching about Jesus, the local authorities got very angry. And we read in the book of Acts right away, they would beat the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, they would persecute Christians, they would, I mean, all the Christians had to leave Jerusalem. So because of these circumstances and also because of famine, the church in Jerusalem was poor. And the Apostle Paul, as he was traveling from place to place, he was, um, he was encouraging local Christians, and especially Christians in Corinth. And we know that Corinth was a very uh, rich city, and it's very likely that Corinthians were like uh, okay financially. So he's asking them to make collections. Now, this collection is voluntary. So, but Paul says, well, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up so that there will be no collecting when I come. He basically says, think about those who are poor. Now, what, teaches, what it teaches us, we are supposed to think about poor Christians too. We are supposed to think how we can help those churches that are struggling financially maybe overseas or in other places where Christians are persecuted. So make collections on a regular basis. It's not one-time collection. So we normally do one-time collections. Hey, there is this cause. Let us make a collection. And everybody gives something. So here, Paul says, no, no. Just make it uh, on a regular basis. Think about those brothers and sisters in Christ who need your help and do that on a regular basis. So it's not general collection for the church. This is something special. This is a special collection for the saints in Jerusalem. So now, another very interesting point here. He says, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside. Why Paul is mentioning the first day of the week? So it's uh, basically it's Sunday. But if you look at the structure of the week, uh, for, for Jews, uh, the, the last day of the week was Sabbath, was Saturday, and the first day of the week was what we call today Sunday. Okay, so on Sabbath, Jews wouldn't work, right? So uh, why then he says the first week, day of the week? So because this is when Jesus rose from the dead, right? So that is why early Christians, I mean, today we say Sunday, um, some other languages, they actually say the Resurrection Day. And, uh, and uh, this is when Christians were gathering. Now, among Christians, there is this debate. Uh, well, because Jews, they were keeping the Sabbath holy, shouldn't we keep the Sabbath holy as well? And, and, and some Christian denominations would even worship on Saturdays, and they would say that whoever worships on Sunday is an antichrist or is, you know, committing a grave sin because we are not worshiping on Saturdays. So here uh, we can see very clearly that first Christians were gathering on the first day of every week, which is Sunday, right? Which is the resurrection day. 
which proves that we are doing the right thing, right? We're like Corinthians. We're gathering on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the resurrection day. So, and when I arrive, Paul says, I will send those whom you accredit by a letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. And now I remember how we normally gather, say, if we think about big uh, church organizations, what happens, we kind of gather or collect money for certain missions or for certain projects. But very often, individual churches, they do not have direct contact with those whom they help. So normally, you give to a larger uh, Christian body, say, to the synod. And then the synod gives your money to whoever they think need their money, which is, which is okay. But what is missing in this, uh, in this model that people from a local church, say, in Jenison, they do not see those people whom they help. And this is um, a big problem nowadays. That is why many churches, they at some point refuse to give to big orga Christian organizations, and they uh, choose instead to find a local church or somebody, you know, local Christians overseas uh, or in their own country and give money directly to that local church overseas or local community here in this country. So in that way, it gives them the sense of, oh, okay, we actually see those people whom we help or with whom we work. But if you give to a big organization, you never see those people. There is no personal connection. It's interesting that the apostle Paul doesn't say, well, give the money to me. I will take the money to the church in Jerusalem. He says, when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter. So he basically wants Corinthians to go directly to Jerusalem and to meet those people whom they're helping. And in the, uh, in the light of you know, the church being persecuted, these personal connections were super important. Also, most Corinthians were Gentiles, and it was good for Gentiles and Jews to actually work together. So the Apostle Paul wants Corinthians to go to Jerusalem themselves and to give their gift to the church in Jerusalem. So this personal connections, very important. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. The Apostle Paul even doesn't know if he would go, right? He says, well, if you think that I should go with you to Jerusalem, I would be happy to go with you to Jerusalem. And again, you see uh, uh, transparency and integrity. The Apostle Paul, uh, he is not touching the money. He, he, ha he wants Corinthians to take their own money to the church in Jerusalem by themselves, right? So he doesn't want to be involved in any financial, you know, um, he doesn't want to take upon himself any financial responsibility so that he can later be accused that he mishandled the money somehow. So it just teaches us a lot about how the church was functioning from the very beginning and what kind of financial practices uh, uh, we uh, have today. And, and by the way, uh, so when there is no financial integrity, I read recently in the news in Grand Rapids, I don't remember the name of the church, so a guy was a, a treasurer and at the same time he was... Uh, he was a company owner that was a kind of... Uh, servicing the church in a certain ways and uh, they recently I mean it was on the news uh, big scandal so he was paying himself without performing any services like every month a couple of thousand dollars and I think the total amount was eight hundred thousand dollars so you know and it happened in Grand Rapids recently you know it's one person uh, who pays to himself you know, to his own company, you know, from the church's accounts. So, and Paul, he says, I don't want to have anything to do with the money. You collect, you take the money to this church in Jerusalem. 
If you want me to join, I will go with you. But I'm not touching the money. This is very clever, right? So if it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia. And you remember the, the, the map I showed you? He's in Ephesus on the right hand. Corinth is here. And between Ephesus and Corinth, you know, there is sea. And he can, can very easily just uh, sail. Uh, but instead, he decides to take this land route. Uh, and he wants to walk via Macedonia. So it's long route. So I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. Why the Apostle Paul wants to go to Macedonia? Because there are other Christian churches and he wants to visit them. So this plan, unfortunately, would not happen. And in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul will be explaining to them, well, look, I was planning to visit you, but certain things interfered, right? So, but this is his plan. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia because he wanted to visit other Christian churches that he planted. And perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. So now what happens, he is now in Ephesus. He is working in Ephesus. Uh, he is waiting for the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost would be in May. So, and this is when travel season starts, because you normally wouldn't travel during the winter. You need nice warm weather because you are walking, right? You are walking. And even if you want to use a ship, you still not need wa nice warm weather. So, and he wants to walk, to go to all the places during the summer, and then spend winter in Corinth, you know, to... We already know that they had a lot of questions and a lot of problems, and he needs to spend some time there just to help them to sort out all those problems and questions. So, for I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Again, so this little phrase, if the Lord permits, it's so anti today's culture. What today's culture tells us, well, you have a weekly planner, you have a schedule, you know where you would go in May, in June, in July, in August, you plan your vacation, you know everything about your life half a year in advance, or maybe one year in advance, right? And, you know, planner schedules, and Paul says one little phrase, if the Lord permits. So he allows flexibility. He's flexible. He plans, but he plans in pencil. And we Christians have a lot of problems when we cannot plan in pencil. We want to plan in ink, right? So we plan it. This is how we do it. So, but, but when, especially uh, when you talk about God's ministry, God can unexpectedly change the circumstances and move you in a different direction. So you are planning to start student ministry, and then all of a sudden the Lord says, well, you will be also starting family ministry, you know, for example. And, and if you are not flexible enough, you can get stuck just with one plan, and you would be pushing that plan, but this is not how the Lord works in his church. So if the Lord permit, permits, and the Lord would not permit, and he wouldn't come, so Paul was right when he said this phrase, right? He wouldn't be able to come to Corinth. He was busy with other things. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. And as we already know, Pentecost, so it's uh, the end of the spring. It's when the travel season begins. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. And this is amazing. When we go to the book of Acts, we can see what is happening in Ephesus at the moment. The Apostle Paul is preaching, and people are responding to the message, uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But also, at the same time, something happens. In Ephesus, they have a big industry. And that big industry is to make little idols, all kinds of idols. And because Paul is preaching about Jesus, 
people no longer believe in those idols and nobody buys those idols. So people who run that industry, idol makers, are super angry at the Apostle Paul. He says, he destroys our economy. This is our economy. So, and he disrupts it. And they hate him and he, he is in a lot of trouble. But this is how the Apostle Paul describes the situation in just one sentence. He says, for a wide door, for effective work, has opened to me. And the Apostle Paul in his epistles, whenever God opens a door, he, he says, well, God opens a door. This is his phrase. Whenever there is an opportunity, Paul speaks about doors. God opened this door here. God opened this door here. So, but also... It's interesting how he sees effective work, because how do we see effective work? We see it as success with no opposition. Everybody loves us. Everybody wants our product. No, no, no. The Apostle Paul, he sees this huge opportunity. And at the same time, there are adversaries. There are people who are hating him and fight him and want to kill him. And still he is able to see, in the midst of that turmoil, opportunities. So many people are coming to him, uh, to Jesus, but so many people are hating him. But he is able to discern, and he is still able to see, okay, there is a huge potential here. This is what the Lord is doing. So many people are becoming Christians. They are just amazing. And he wants to stay there a little bit longer. When Timothy comes, now Timothy, you know, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy in the Bible. So Timothy is Apostle Paul, uh, kind of spiritual son. He got to know him when Timothy was young. Uh, we know that Timothy's dad was not a Christian. Timothy's mo mom and uh, grandma, they were Christians, and they brought Timothy to Christianity. By the way, the role of women, the role of moms, the role of grandmothers, right? So you can bring your grandchildren to Christ. You know, although Timothy's father, he was not a Christian. So... He becomes a spiritual son for the Apostle Paul, and he accompanies him and helps the Apostle Paul. Now, in this particular case, we know that the Apostle Paul, he says, I will send to you Timothy. He talks about that in chapter 4. He talks about this again. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. Let no one despise him, help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. So now, it's just interesting how this uh, first church works. The Apostle Paul is just, you know, Jesus rose from the dead 20 years ago. And already we have people who are so committed to the ministry of the gospel that they left their occupations behind and they're just doing the Lord's work. They are totally devoted, so there are no seminaries yet, there are no monasteries or other places where people can say, well, I devote myself to the Lord. And still, people would completely devote themselves to the gospel, and they would go from place to place, they would travel, they would suffer, they would be hungry and thirsty, but they would do the Lord's work. Now, we need people like that today. We are too comfortable in our own lives. We don't want to do the Lord's work. Very rarely who wants to sacrifice the comfort of their lives today. We want everything to be comfortable. We want to enjoy life, right? And this is a huge example. If everybody was like us today, just coming to church when it's comfortable or participating in events when it's comfortable, but other than that, I have my life, I have my schedule, then the gospel probably would never reach us. It would die somewhere in Corinth and Ephesus with those comfortable Christians, right? Christians who are comfortable. It's particularly because of such people as the Apostle Paul, Timothy, and others who would sacrifice everything that the gospel of Jesus Christ spread all over the Roman Empire and reached me and you. Isn't that amazing? 
Okay, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you. The, these phrases put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as I am. Well, you need to understand that the church in Corinth has a lot of problems. We already learned about their problems from 1 Corinthians. We also see that the apostle Paul is not very nice to them. He rebukes them. Well, he encourages them as well, but he is strict. He says, this is wrong, this is wrong. It's very possible that there would be some people in the church in Corinth when Timothy comes, and Timothy, Timothy is coming from the Apostle Paul, that they, were, they would attack Timothy. They would say, who are you that you are telling me? I have my relationship with God. I give money to this church. I've been a member of this church for three years, from the very beginning. They're meeting at my house. Who are you to tell me all these things about, you know, the truth? And, you know... The, the, the teachings of Jesus Christ. I want to believe what I want to believe. And Paul says, let Noah despise him, help him on his way in peace. Just listen to him. And he will be talking about this, listen to the leaders who are teaching the truth. He will be talking about this several times in this chapter. Listen to them. He says, submit to them. Listen to them. Because they are teaching the truth. And this is exactly what is happening today. We have people who teach the truth and people who teach false teachings. To whom we listen, to whom we submit. That's a big question. Now concerning our brother Apollos. And we already saw this name at the very beginning of this uh, epistle. When they were dividing themselves. right? They would say, well... I follow Apollos, and some would say, I follow the Apostle Peter, and some would say, I follow the Apostle Paul. So, and Apollos was one of those people who, he didn't cause division, but people decided to create divisions around him. Oh, I'm following Apollos. Now concerning our brother Apollos, and, and Paul says, well, actually, Apollos, Peter, myself, we are all one team. We are all working for Jesus Christ. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Why would Apollos say, well, guys, you are creating so much mass and divisions and you use my name? Maybe I'd better not come to Corinth for a while. Maybe I would let you just, you know, I, I don't want to. You know, be in the middle of all these fights and divisions and everything. But he decided not to come now when he has opportunity. We don't know much about that. Verse 13 and 14 all are military terms. Paul says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like man, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. So verse 13, military terms. Strong, watchful. You need to understand that the, the devil, you, we were singing today in our opening hymn that the dragon, the foe, he wants to destroy the church and the state. And we need to watch. And Jesus, many times in the gospel, Jesus says, watch. Don't fall asleep. Be sober. Watch. Watch what is happening. Ma many times Jesus uh, invites us to watch. Paul says the same. Be watchful. Watch. Stand firm in the faith, a military term, when you are being attacked and the church is being attacked 24-7 by the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, right? So we need to stand firm. If we relax, enjoy life, just as if everything is okay, this is when the enemy can attack us. Act like man, like be strong. Uh, back then, soldiers were men only, right? Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. This is unusual, but he already devoted an entire chapter, chapter 13, to love. When he says love surpasses all the spiritual gifts. But this is not romantic love. This is not do whatever you want love. This is divine love. Divine love, which means, okay, God loves you, you love God, but we don't love sin. This kind of love would never love, affirm, or celebrate sin. 
This is a holy love, love of God. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia. And again, when you think about Corinth, Corinth was the capital of a Roman province which was called Achaia. So when Paul came to Corinth, it's very likely that Stephanas, although we read today uh, Acts 18, uh, which describes how Paul came to, uh, to Corinth, and Stephanas was not mentioned, but somehow maybe he is not from Corinth, maybe he is from an area which is close to Corinth, but in any event, we are reading about this uh, household, this name, who are the first Christians in that area. Isn't that amazing? When you come to a certain place, you want to know who was the first. Who, you know, who became the first Christian in that area? And it's Stephanus. Somehow the Apostle Paul was preaching to them and they became Christians. And the household of Stephanus, and, and when Paul writes, he begins his first Corinthians, uh, so he, in chapter 1, he says, I did not baptize anybody except for Stephanus, this, this guy, and his household. They were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. So, again, like Timothy, like the Apostle Paul, like Achille, Priscilla, these are the first Christians who left everything behind, ignored their comfortable life, and devoted themselves to the service of the gospel. They would serve the saints, serve the church. Without these guys, without these people, we wouldn't be able to know about Jesus. It's specifically the people like that. And that is why the Apostle Paul says, be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. Listen to them. This is what the Apostle Paul says. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaicus. Fortunatus and Achaicus, uh, it's probably uh, they are slaves uh, or um, um, their names tells, tell us that they may be slaves, very popular slave names. They probably are from the household of Stephanas. Stephanas is the head of the family, but he also has slaves. And Fortunatus and Achaius, they belong to his household, and they're coming together with Stephanus to visit the Apostle Paul in Ephesus. Because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Such people should be respected. We need to respect people who do the work of ministry. We need, we need to respect and we need to support such people. The churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Prisca, or Priscilla, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. And again, Aquila and Priscilla, they are the Jews who came from Rome to Corinth. And when the Apostle Paul came to Corinth, they were the first ones whom he met. And he was staying, then they believed in Jesus, and he was staying at their house. He was staying at their house, and they were tent makers. They were making tents and preaching the word of God every Saturdays, and will be getting in trouble every time, because many people would hate them because of that message, and would despise them and revile them. So, but we see that once the church in Corinth was established, the Apostle Paul moved to Ephesus, to a different city, and he was working there. He was building a church there. And we see that Achilla and Prisca, or Priscilla, they accompanied the Apostle Paul. And now they are with him in Ephesus. And they also will go with him to other places to help him to build the churches. And again, without such people as Achilla and Priscilla, I don't know the future of the Christian church. I'm so glad that there are people who respond to the call of the Lord and are willing to dedicate themselves to the work of the Lord. And I feel so ashamed that, I mean, we as Christians, we are so focused on ourselves. And, you know, our Christian life is just one activity, one thing 
one of many different things, maybe important, but just one of many in our lives. It's not the main thing in our lives. So we need to rethink and reconsider our relationship to the work of God in general. Send your hearty greetings in the Lord, together with the church in their house. This phrase, together with the church in their house, for the first 300 years, Christians didn't have churches like this. And they didn't have bills to pay for, for electricity and other things for the churches like this. So they would meet at someone's house. And again, uh, a well-to-do person would have a house with an entertainment entertainment room. An entertainment room can comfortably hold 30 people. And this is where first Christians would meet. They would meet at somebody's houses. And it's only when the Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, 300 years later, when the emperor sta started giving land and buildings to the church. And this is when the church started getting buildings. But also the emperor would pay for those buildings. So today, if you go around, you see so many buildings, and I don't know, many churches are struggling to pay for those buildings because you need to repair them and pay for all kinds of bills, right, and everything else. And I'm thinking about the structure of today's church. Maybe it is not a bad idea to have house churches rather than buildings like this. At least, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, that uh, part of the budget, you know. Otherwise, uh, it becomes a heavy burden for many churches, right? The churches of Asia send you greetings. Achille and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And this is a typical greeting um, in Eastern cultures, a quick kiss on both cheeks, right, as a greeting. I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let them be accursed. Okay, again, if somebody comes to the church, teaches false teachings, and creates divisions, and destroys the church, and practices sexual immorality in the church, and this is what is happening in our churches nowadays as well, right? All kind of problems, all kind of sins. And Paul says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. And accursed means cursed. And here we need to remember about the discipline Jews practiced uh, in their culture. So if somebody was committed, committing a grave sin, he or she would be given a warning. So they, they would be told, for 30 days, you cannot come to the synagogue. You have 30 days to repent and change. And, and if they do not listen to you, so then they, won't be, they, they would be uh, not allowed in the synagogue for undefined period of time. But still there would be an invitation to repent. And the third stage is, if that person doesn't change their ways, does not repent, so they would be cut off the synagogue forever. And this is what the word accursed here means. Well, when it's, it's, it's like there is no chance to come back, right? So now the Apostle Paul says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, doesn't listen to Jesus, doesn't follow Jesus' teachings, doesn't do what pleases Jesus, let him be accursed. Now, how does that compare to today's Christian understanding that God loves all people and the church is inclusive of everyone and everything and God doesn't care about sin? Let us affirm who we are. Let us celebrate our sins. This is a complete false teaching that is being preached today in many churches in the world. Well, Paul is very clear. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. How does that work with our understanding, oh, God does not judge? Who am I to judge? No, no, no. Here we see a very clear judgment. 
There are stages. Stages, invitation to repent, but there is also the point when final judgment is made. Our Lord come. This is what all the first Christians were saying, and we are saying the same, we want Jesus to come. And then immediately the Apostle Paul offers blessings to everyone who loves the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Fair is the sunshine, fair is the